thankful for all that he has done, all he is doing, and all he will do. Uh, amen. 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 Uh, if you are one of our guests today, we want to say thank you for being here. Uh, I pray that you stop by uh, the Welcome Center there in the middle and, and receive your wonderful, wonderful purple bag, uh, our gift of appreciation to you uh, for showing up. And if you didn't get one, you want to make sure you get one. You can stop by room number 22. It's our Connect Center. Once we're all said and done, if you have brought a guest or are a guest, I want you to come by room 22. It's where we get a chance to meet you, shake your hand, uh, make sure you got uh, that bag, uh, and you walk out of here understanding more about us, uh, and uh, we can answer any questions that you might have about the Church of Christ at Boulder Crest. We are a group of people uh, who are believers of Jesus Christ, who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who are together uh, to worship, to grow, and to serve, and we do all of that uh, together. Uh, for those here at the Body of Christ that meets here on Boulder Crest Road, uh, for those who are interested uh, in serving at the Nicholas House, that is one of our uh, missional endeavors, uh, we're going to have a brief orientation meeting here in this auditorium when we're all said and done with our worship service uh, today. Uh, so we want you to join us for that brief uh, orientation. We are on a mission there. We're on a mission around this world uh, to make 3.5 million disciples, or at least be the spark uh, that ignites into 3.5 million disciples uh, all over this world. This is an opportunity uh, for us to, in fact, uh, serve uh, the city of Atlanta. And to those who are watching uh, in our uh, Boulder Crest extended family uh, online, we call them our B family, uh, we are so thankful uh, that you are watching online and we pray uh, that today's uh, worship service and the message uh, is a blessing to you. So at this point in time, if you're able to stand, let me invite you on your feet uh, and uh, let's turn to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. And our text this morning uh, is going to begin at verse number 46 and conclude at verse number 52. Uh, for those visiting, you can find a copy of the sermon notes inside of your bulletin, uh, and you can kind of follow along uh, with us. Mark chapter number 10, beginning at verse number 46, concluding at verse number 52. But in our respect for the Word of God, it's not something that we need to enter into lightly. Uh, it is something that we need God's power and the guidance of His Holy Spirit to lead us through. Uh, and so we are going to pray uh, that He would guide us in our study and exploration of the text this morning. Pray with me, please. Father God in heaven, we want to say thank you for yet another day. Father, you have been so good to us. Uh, and your goodness, it, it, al it almost overwhelms us. Uh, dear God, how good you have been. Father, we're thankful uh, for your goodness showered onto us in the form of Jesus the Christ. Father, we're thankful for the life of Jesus and for what Jesus means to each and every one of us. We're thankful for the blood that has cleansed us of our sins. And dear God, we're thankful for this word that we are about to study today. Might your Holy Spirit have his way with us today, dear Father. Father God, that we might be able to see your word with clarity, that we might be able to see it, not only see it, but help us to understand it. But not only understand it, dear Father, to help us obey the word of God. Father God, help us to be obedient to what we see today. Prick us and prod us and, and move our hearts in the right direction. We pray for this audience who hears this word, whether in person or online, dear God, that the word would pierce even the toughest of all hearts, dear God, and that it might win them over, that they might give themselves over to Jesus Christ on today. Father God, we ask that you would add to the church today. Father, lead us, guide us, that your Holy Spirit be our God. May he fill our hearts. May he fill this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let us say amen. Here's what the Word of God has to say, and this is from the English Standard Version. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, 
what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This morning we're going to preach a lesson entitled, A Blind, Persistent, and Specific Faith. You may be seated. A blind, persistent, and specific faith. As we continue with our series, Marvels, the Life-Saving Miracles of Jesus. What we have been doing in this series, for those who might be visiting with us, is looking at the miracles of Jesus as seen, uh, written in the biblical account of his life and times. What I want you to see is that the miracles of Jesus, though they are of antiquity, they are still very much relevant. They point to what he can do with a life today. He can still save a life. He can work a miracle in a life even today. But one of the most popular miracles that we see in the life and times of Jesus is that of the healing of the blind. On various occasions, Jesus lends his power to this particular predicament. The healing was not only for what it did for someone physically, but it spoke into what it could do with someone spiritually. See, the healing of the blind was important. For them in antiquity, these in these times of the biblical record, how one would see someone who was suffering from blindness would point to the idea that they thought that they were suffering because of their sin. In John chapter 9 and verse number 2, when Jesus encounters a man who was born blind, his disciples had a question upon encountering him, and it was this, uh, who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So when Jesus comes into someone's life and heals them of their blindness, it not only blesses them physically, but it would bless them spiritually as well. It would not only give them a new start physically, but it would give them a new start spiritually as well. That's because Jesus is the Lord over a new start. Now, in looking at this audience today, I do believe that there are some amongst us that are in need of a new start. If you're in need of a new start, you can say amen. We are all in need of a new start, and I want to point you to the one who can give it to you, and he can give it to you today, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is going to bring his new start power to a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. In our text today, we find Jesus and his disciples leaving ancient Jericho. They have come into Jericho, as verse number 46 says, and then they immediately leave Jericho. They spend a very short period of time there. And Jesus and his band of followers, along with a great crowd who's likely been witness to all the things or some of the things that Jesus could do. Maybe they've heard about some of the things that he could do. And with a great excitement, this throng of people, they are leaving ancient Jericho, likely on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This would be the final Passover in Jesus' earthly ministry. It's late in his ministry, and late in his ministry, there's a great crowd of folk along with his disciples, great energy, leaving Jericho. But Mark, the writer of this text, is going to tell us and introduce us immediately to someone who cannot go with Jesus to Jerusalem, at least right off the bat. There is someone who is there, someone who is present, but he's not with this crowd. Someone who's not part of these followers of Jesus Christ immediately because he's sitting by the roadside. And he's sitting by the roadside because that's all he can do. Why is it that he's sitting by the roadside? Why is it that that is all that he can do? Well, because he is blind. Verse number 47 of our text, he says that, or verse number 46, they came to Jericho as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. There's an outcast sitting by the roadside. An outcast because he can't go with everybody else. 
an outcast because he can't travel in the same way as everyone else. But Mark gives us his name. He says his name is Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And he tells us two things right off the bat about this Bartimaeus. Number one, he was blind. And number two, he was a, a beggar. His disability, coupled with this ancient time, would have had this blind beggar Bartimaeus sitting by a roadside asking alms, asking charity, asking for mercy from anyone who passed by because it would put him in a needy position. At the time, there was no work that he could do. At the time, there was nothing that he could do to support himself. So he's entirely dependent upon the mercy of everyone else. So he's sitting by the roadside as the men and women march through ancient Jericho on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to worship. It's the perfect time for Bartimaeus to be there. One of the pillars of Jewish piety was that of almsgiving. So these worshipers would already have in their mind to give and show mercy and to help out the needy because they were trying to show how religious they were. Bartimaeus is laying by the roadside. And he's taking advantage of their piety, their generosity, their mercy, their love, because he needs it. But what Bartimaeus is about to find out is that it really wasn't their mercy he needed. It really wasn't their kindness that he needed. He needed the kindness and the mercy of the one who was about to pass on by. Jesus and his disciples are marching through and they just so happen to encounter this blind beggar Bartimaeus. I don't think there are any coincidences. See, sometimes I think that you are where you are at the right time for a specific purpose. I think you're here today at this hour for a specific purpose, and I do believe it's to hear about this man named Jesus. Bartimaeus is there by the roadside. Verse number 47, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He understands immediately what it is he really needs and who he needs it from. See, it's a blessing. You know what? It's a blessing to know what you really need. But it's even more of a blessing to know who you need it from. Bartimaeus knows exactly what he needs, and he, know, and he knows who he needs it from. Let me bring you into the scene. There's likely a lot of commotion going on, a, a lot of great energy around Jesus and his disciples and the crowd coming by this roadside. And, and Bartimaeus, he can't see it, but he can hear it. He can't see it, but he can sense it. And as Luke writes in his gospel, in Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 36, that, that Bartimaeus, Luke said, Bartimaeus asked a question. He asked, what does this mean? What does what mean? What does this crowd mean? What does this noise mean? What, what's going on? Why is it so energetic? What, what's going on? I can't see it. All I can do is hear it. And I can sense that something different is taking place. Well, the people, they tell Bartimaeus, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Well, what's going on? Jesus of Nazareth, he's coming. He's coming. Who's coming? Jesus of Nazareth is coming. And then blind beggar Bartimaeus did what he did best, and he began to beg. He started to beg, but his begging was, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now remember, before Bartimaeus was by the road, and he would have been begging for money. He would have been begging and asking things from the people. But suddenly, within the atmosphere, 
Suddenly, there on the roadside, there appeared a better option for blind beggar Bartimaeus. And he said, never mind for the people, something better has arrived, and that is Jesus. So no longer am I asking for money, now I'm asking for mercy. I need some mercy. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Son of David, I need some mercy. The people were a good option, but now he's found a better option. See, you've got to be able to tell the difference between good and best. There's a lot of things going to pop in your life that are good, but you always got to be able to see what is best. And what is best, what surrounds what is best, anything that has to do with Jesus is best. Let me be honest with you. This is the best thing you're going to do all week. This is the best thing you're going to do. You're going to do a lot of good stuff. This is the best. You might hear a lot of folks talking about a lot of things. This is the best thing that you're going to hear all week. You might not like me, and you might not like what, how I'm saying it or what I say or my style, all that. Never mind for all that. This is the best thing you're going to hear all week. Why? Because it's about Jesus. Bartimaeus understood this. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. His ears were attuned to listening for what it was that was ultimately going to change his life. He couldn't see him. All he could do is hear about it. Maybe Bartimaeus had heard the news about how Jesus had healed other blind men. Maybe Bartimaeus had heard the news about how Jesus made the lame to walk. Maybe Bartimaeus had heard about how Jesus of Nazareth had loosed the tongues of the mute. Maybe blind Bartimaeus had heard all that Jesus of Nazareth had done. He couldn't see it. All he could do was hear it. He was blind, but he knew what Jesus could do. He had faith. He had what I call blind faith. It's not based upon what he's seen. It's simply based upon what he has heard. And for hearing, that was enough for Bartimaeus. It was enough for Paul. Paul said in Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 17, he said, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. For Bartimaeus, hearing what he had heard likely about Jesus was enough for him. Enough for him for what? Enough for him to say, son of David. Watch this. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. But when Bartimaeus calls out, he doesn't say Jesus of Nazareth. He says, Jesus, son of David. That's different. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. That's simply saying Jesus is a man from Nazareth, and he's coming. But what Bartimaeus does, he says, I hear what you're saying, that Jesus of Nazareth is coming. But even though I'm blind, this is how I see Jesus. I see him as the son of David. Well, what is that? That's a messianic term. What do I mean by messianic term? It's a term that refers to Jesus being the Jewish Messiah. It is a term that refers to Jesus being the anointed king of God. It refers to the power that he knows that Jesus has. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus, son of David. I need mercy. See, Bartimaeus is blind. But he has enough faith to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7 and verse number 17. When God, through the prophet Nathan, is talking to David, and he says these words to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Bartimaeus is blind, but he has enough faith to see that Jesus is this descendant of David that Samuel wrote about long ago. He has blind faith. He's blind, but he has enough faith to see 
that Bartimaeus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 1 or 11 verses 1 and 2. What does that say? It says this, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Who is Jesse? Jesse is David's daddy. Uh, Bartimaeus sees Jesus as uh, this shoot that has come from the stump of Jesse. A branch from its roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. How Bartimaeus sees Jesus, even though his physical eyes cannot see, is that of the Jewish Messiah? Is that of one with power? Power. Is that of one whom the Holy Spirit dwells? Bartimaeus can't see, but he sure can see Jesus. Because he has blind faith. Blind faith. He sees Jesus as the one who can give him the mercy that he's looking for. The one who can give him exactly what he needs. He sees Jesus even though his physical eyes have failed him. His spiritual eyes are working, and it causes him to be able to see exactly who Jesus is and exactly what Jesus can do. Let me ask you this question this morning. How do you see Jesus? Because however you see Jesus will determine what you ask him to do for you. Your prayers, your requests of the Lord will be based, they will only go as far as how you see the Lord. How do you see Jesus this morning? Is he just that dude you talk about on Sundays? And then you leave somewhere for the rest of the week. How do you see Jesus? Is he simply a man from history? A man like unto Julius Caesar or a Napoleon Bonaparte or an Abraham Lincoln or a Martin Luther King Jr. or a Nelson Mandela? How do you see Jesus? Was he simply a prophet, a good man, one who did good things? How do you see Jesus? But if you see Jesus as Lord, if you see him as king, as you see him as redeemer, if you see him as savior, he can save your life. He can redeem your life. He can rule your life. He can take you places you never even dreamed of. How do you see Jesus? Do you have enough faith, blind faith? To, to, to see who he really is and what it is he can do. See, sometimes we can't see the Lord. Sometimes we can't see him. Sometimes we can't see what he wants us to do. Like he may want you to make a move. He may want you to do something. He may, he, he, he may just want to show up in your circumstance. He's in your circumstance. He can, he's there, but you can't see him. See, that's the time that you got to exercise blind faith. So you got to move even though you can't see him because he's there. You got to just know he's there through your faith. See, you got to understand that he's never left you alone. and he, He'll never leave you alone. You might feel alone. You might not be able to see him in your storm. You got to have enough faith to know that he is there and to know what he can do. Bartimaeus is coming to Jesus. He can't see Jesus, but at the same time, his spiritual eyes are working. He knows who Jesus is, and he knows what Jesus can do. Do you have enough faith? Blind faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sometimes you're not going to be able to see, but you got to still keep on stepping, knowing that the Lord is by your side. So let me encourage you, develop some blind faith, but not only blind faith, but I want, you show, I want to show you some persistent faith as well. Bartimaeus had blind faith, but he also had persistent faith. He's crying out to Jesus, and he's crying out and crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse number 48, and many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. His cries were so persistent and, and likely so loud maybe even so annoying that, that the people were saying, hey, man, you need to be quiet. Hush. Stop all that. You're too loud. You're making too much noise. You're going on and on and on. They rebuked him, meaning they forcefully, they forcefully were trying to tell him to stop. But he cried out all the more. You know, the thing I hate, one of my pet peeves is to be shushed. 
I can't stand that. Because it's like, you know, it's like you're, what's called, you're sunning me, right? You're, you're treating me like I'm your kid, right? You, you, shh. You, you know, it makes me very rebellious. You know, shh, and you want to say, shh. But what I do when you shush me, I just get louder. I'm being real with you. I'm confessing it to you. If it's a sin, then Lord got to forgive me of that. But it makes me rebellious because you're shushing me. And I can see Bartimaeus is a lot like that. They try and say, shh, and he grew louder. Son of David! Have mercy on me. What is Bartimaeus being? He is being persistent. So church, let me pull you in right now. Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you with this. Have some persistent faith. Don't allow other people to dissuade you from calling on the name of the Lord. And, and they will try. They will try. And, and they will try not so much with their mouths, but through their actions. Because, see, they'll do some, people will do some stuff to you. They'll hurt you. They'll stab you in the back. People you thought you knew, they'll turn on you. And, and you thought, you thought you knew them, but, they, but they'll turn on you, and it'll discourage you to the point where you don't even feel like praying. You ever been like that? You don't even feel like praying because you're so down and you're so hurt? Because, see, the people have tried to dissuade you. Not necessarily on purpose, but through their actions. Their actions have been so hurtful, you don't even feel like, you know you should pray, but you don't even feel like calling on the name of the Lord. Don't let anybody have that much power over you. Because let me tell you, we love people, and we serve people, and we help people. We, we, we want to help pick, uh, pick people up, but you don't live for people. You don't live for them. You live for the Lord. So you keep on being persistent in your prayers and your petitions to the Lord. Don't let anybody else have that much power over you where you stop doing that. Because when you are persistent, the Lord pays attention. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at verse number 49. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. What did Jesus do? He stopped. Why did he stop? He kept calling. He kept being persistent. He kept on, as, as, as the book of Luke, and Luke 11, uh, 5 through 10 says, uh, he kept on asking. He kept on knocking. He kept on seeking. Out of his persistence, Jesus stopped. See, there's something about a persistent prayer. It causes the Lord. He's already paying attention, but he's paying even more attention now. So you keep on being persistent. Have some blind faith. See the Lord where when, when uh, you're going through, when the storms of life are blowing so hard that you can't see him. Have some blind faith to know that he's still there. And because you know he's still there, you're going to be persistent. I need you. Then Mark says, that this man, Bartimaeus, in verse number 50, throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. See, I, I, I think it's important how Mark doesn't leave out this detail. What is the detail? He threw off his cloak. I, I think that's important. And, and here's why I think it's important. Him throwing off his cloak, his cloak was his coat. It but he's a blind beggar. So it's probably more than just his coat. It might be his bed. It could even be his blanket. Whatever it was, it was that which kept Bartimaeus comfortable. It would keep him comfortable. But Jesus is calling him. And he sprang up and he threw it off. What did he do? He threw off what was comfortable and ran to that which was exceptional. He threw off the ordinary and ran toward the extraordinary. He realized who Jesus was through blind faith. He was persistent enough that Jesus stopped and said, come here. 
Then he threw off what was comfortable and ran toward what was exceptional. What are you saying, team? I'm saying this. There may be times when you have to leave what is comfortable for that which is exceptional. Because, see, oftentimes you can't have both. You, you may have to actually shed what's comfortable and move toward what's exceptional. Well, what's comfortable in your life? Well, it, it could be your job. It, it could be uh, a relationship that you have to shed because it's maybe a people group that you have to shed. You move away from the comfortable because Jesus and what he's calling you to is always the exceptional. But here's the question. Listen to me. Do you have enough faith to leave? Do you have enough faith? Well, you got to see that he's there. You got to keep on calling. But you say, I've done that. Maybe, 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 uh, maybe I, I still don't feel like I have enough faith. Here's a third piece that you need to add. You need to get real specific. Real specific. What do you mean, Timur? This is exactly what I mean. Real specific. And Jesus said to him, verse number 51, what do you want me to do for you? That's a direct question. It requires a specific answer. And the blind man said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. That is a specific request. It's a supplication. The type of supplication Paul talked about in Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 6. Let your request be made known to God. What would cover these requests that, that are specific, that are filled with thanksgiving? I'm, I'm filling my request with thanksgiving because I got blind faith enough to know that he's going to provide it. But I'm going to be real specific with him. I'm going to give a supplication, a supplication, a specific request. Because I have faith enough to know that the Lord has the power to answer them. I got faith enough to be specific. I got faith enough to say, Lord, I need this. Lord, I want this. And I know that if it's according to your will, I will have this. But, Lord, I need this. I want this. That's what Bartimaeus did. I want to recover my sight. Now, now uh, your, your, your King, New King James says receive my sight. But the word receive actually means recover, which says that at one point in time, Bartimaeus could see. He's lost his vision, and he wants it back. God already, the Lord already knows that's what he wanted. Yeah, he, with his omniscience, he already knows what you want. But you know what he wants to know? And he already knows the answer. Do you have enough faith to be specific? Do you have enough faith not to beat around the bush? Well, maybe I kind of want, you know, if, you know, maybe if it's your will, maybe, Lord, if you could, maybe if you could supply this, maybe, could you, maybe, please, maybe. Lord, I want it. Lord, I need it. And if I don't need it, show me I don't need it. If I don't want it, let me lose the taste for it. But dear God, I want this. I need this. And I know that you have the power, and I give you thanksgiving and praise already. Because I know you can provide. But I want it and I need it. Be specific. Let me recover my sight. Maybe there was a time in your life where you used to faithfully walk but you've walked away from God. God didn't move, you moved. Just be honest, you moved. And you got so far away that you're now no longer able to see him. You started, you got involved with some stuff that's pulled you away from him. You got to be honest with yourself. You got involved with some stuff and it pulled you away from the Lord. You can't see him. You know what you need to do. You need to get real specific. Lord, I want to see you again. And I need you to pull me back to you by any means necessary. I'm too weak to do it myself, but I need, I need you to pull me back to you by any means necessary. I lean on your strength. Pull me back to you. That's getting specific about your prayer. Specifically ask him to, and he shall have enough faith. Blind, persistent, specific. And this blind, persistent, and specific faith did this to Bartimaeus. Verse number 52, Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. He, he, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Your faith, this is act of faith. This is not just mental belief. This is not just mental assent that Jesus is, is, is Jesus. 
Uh, that, that's not enough to save anyone. It takes act of faith. An act of faith that brought uh, uh, Bartimaeus to the point where he called out to Jesus. It's act of faith. Uh, act of faith to the point where uh, he kept on calling Jesus, even though the people tried to tell him to be quiet. That's act of faith. Act of faith to when Jesus stopped and called him, Bartimaeus got up and ran to Jesus. That's act of faith. Act of faith when, when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And act of faith enough for Bartimaeus to be specific and say exactly what he needed. See, that's act of faith. you got to have act of faith. Act of faith to know when Jesus is calling you. Act of faith to respond to his calling. Act of faith to make him the Lord of your life. Act of faith to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That's act of faith. That's what he is asking of you today. Act of faith to continue to be faithful long after you. Act of faith to believe the microphone is going to come back on when you're preaching. Act of faith. I had no doubts. Act of faith. Act of faith still brings us to the point of salvation. Act of faith is what Paul was talking about in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's active faith. Act of faith of Mark 16 and 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Act of faith to believe and be baptized. Baptism is still the vehicle that brings us to salvation, according to 1 Peter 3 and 21. Active faith will make you well, but do you believe enough? Do you believe enough? And then finally he said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. But then Mark says, immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Go your way. Then Bartimaeus followed him on the way. What do you mean? Jesus' way became Bartimaeus' way. He had a way, but then he realized there's no better way than your way. You've healed me. There's no better way than Jesus' way. If he's healed you, there's no better way than Jesus' way. Yeah, it gets tough. It gets hard. It gets depressing sometimes. People wear on you. But there's still no better way than Jesus' way. He's still your best shot. If you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You will at some point in time feel like giving up, feel like walking out, feel like handing it all over. But he's still your best shot. His way has still got to be your way. You still got to surrender your way over to Jesus Christ. Give him your way. If you are here today you, and, and you're not walking with Jesus, you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, you haven't given your life over to the lordship of Jesus Christ, well, here's what you need. You just need to, you need to believe. You got to have that faith, active faith. Active faith enough to make him the Lord of your life, to confess that he is Lord, to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Active faith enough to keep on following after the way of Jesus. Jesus. Maybe you're here and you're down and you feel that you need some strength. Strength to, to, to put you in position to have blind, persistent, and specific faith. Well, the prayers of the righteous avail much. And we're inviting you down and we're going to pray for you that God give you exactly what you need. But most importantly, most important to those who haven't been baptized, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to give your life over to Jesus Christ. This is your moment. Filled with the Holy Spirit, this is your moment. Won't you come now as we together stand and sing our song of invitation. May God bless you.